at the U.S. Supreme Court today, justices heard arguments on a pair of international human rights cases. At issue is whether corporations and groups can be sued in American courts for alleged involvement in abuses overseas. The justices' decision could have big implications for corporate liability around the globe. Marsha Coyle of National Law Journal was in the courtroom for the arguments, and she joins us to explain. Now, we're talking about two courts, two cases today, which percolated up to the court, one of a two-century-old statute and one of a two-decade-old statute. Exactly. Uh, two uh, separate arguments, two different federal laws, but sharing a common question of whether you can get corporate liability when corporations commit or are complicit in, vi in human rights violations. Now, that's an interesting distinction you just made, commit or are complicit. Yes. Are we talking about American corporations which themselves violated people's human rights, or they stood by while the countries in which they did, with which they did business did it? Uh, either they actually were perpetrators or they aided and abetted, say, in the one of the cases we heard today, the uh, Nigerian military. Uh, the case, the first case involved the alien tort statute, which you pointed out, is old. It was enacted in 1789. And the suit that was brought to the court was brought by a group of Nigerians uh, who either themselves were tortured or had family members who were tortured and killed when they were peacefully protesting oil drilling in a particular region of Nigeria. Uh, they brought their suit against three oil companies and a lower court found that there was uh, no corporate liability in international law and so their suit could not go forward. This is a complicated area mm. when, but the arguments today boil down to this. On the Nigerian family side, their lawyer argues that international law you look to international law to determine what actions, what kind of conduct violates the law of nations. But international law le leaves to each nation's own domestic law who can be held liable. The family's lawyer and the United States here, the Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, argued that under U.S. domestic law, torts like this, uh, actions for injuries, damages for these injuries, has always held that corporations are potentially liable parties. And that was the case in the second case as well, which involved torture? Uh, n that was in uh, the first case, and, mm -hmm. and I should add that there was another argument, right. and a, a very vigorous argument by the oil company's attorney, Kathleen Sullivan, that you look to international law mm -hmm. to answer both questions. Right. And the justices seemed more inclined to follow that argument than the argument of the United States and the families. In the second case, the Torture Victim Protection Act, that gives uh, an action to citizens of the United States as well as non-citizens for damages against an individual, and that word individual is very important mm -hmm. here, who uh, tortures or kills under the color of law of a foreign nation. This argument focused on the meaning of the word individual. The, uh, the claim here was brought by the family of a man who was a nationalized citizen. He was visiting the West Bank with his son when he was arrested by Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Palestinian Authority. He was, there was evidence he was tortured and then he was killed. Uh, and so they brought an action under this law uh, for damages. So the question was, you know, can you hold corporations or an organization like the Palestinian Authority liable when the law speaks to individual? And again, the justices were skeptical that yeah, that's you could do that. That's why I was curious. Right. Were, they, were they listening? Were they receptive? Um, they gave the lawyer for uh, the family here a very hard time. As Justice Scalia said, Individual isn't a strange word. It's not an odd word. It's used all the time, and it means individual. But the lawyer for uh, Aziz Mohammed, who is the, the plaintiff in this case, he said that in every tort regime in the United States law, Congress has always provided for corporate or organizational liability, and this law is a tort law. He also argued that it, there was no good reason not to hold, there was no good reason to exempt corporations from here. The whole purpose of this law is compensation, deterrence, uh, and accountability. 
Now, to a non-legal mind, listening to this argument about corporations' liability versus individual liability sounds a lot. It sounds like it tracks a lot with other arguments we've heard from the court about whether corporations are liable, whether speech. I'm thinking of Citizens United and political spending cases. Is that is there any similarity in this case? Well, uh, there are uh, civil rights and human rights organizations who who feel there's something of uh, a parallel here. They're saying, well, the Supreme Court in particular in the Citizens United decision, uh, gave corporations uh, the same rights as human beings when it comes to individuals and individual. campaign spending. Right. right. And now they're saying, will this Supreme Court recognize that corporations, just like human beings, individuals, have responsibilities as well as rights? And the responsibility here is not to violate human rights. Uh, a lot of organizations after Citizens United uh, accused the Roberts Court here of being pro-corporate. And they're looking at this case to see if they can say that again about the Roberts Court, if it should find that corporations cannot be held liable for human rights violations. Marsha Coyle, The National Law Journal. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Gwen.